Good morning. It's Monday, June 16th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, Episode 9. My name is Chris, and it's going to be a big week this week. We're starting with a big episode. Uh, we finally gotten some actual details on the patents that Microsoft has been holding against Android manufacturers, and i got to tell you, it surprised me. There's a lot more meat here than I expected. Also, we've got some other headlines, including some Steam summer sale rumors and some security roundup items, almost sort of TechSnap style, if you will. And then later in the week, Amazon, supposedly, the rumor is going to release their 3D phone. So we'll be talking about that. And on Wednesday, the lovely Angela Fisher, the wife, will be joining me. So we're going to have a great week, plus my, my cast of characters, my friends, my compadres, my virtual lug, the mumble room, is also here with me today. So guys, let's get started with our first headline today, because um, I, felt, I felt like uh, this, is sort of, this sort of broke over Friday, which usually means people are trying to bury the story, so I wanted to make sure we grabbed it. Apple, Cisco, and AT&T have joined Microsoft in their fight against a global search warrant. For those of you not familiar, uh, the U.S. government was going after Microsoft for a customer's data, I believe in their Ireland data center. Microsoft fought back saying, no, no, you need to provide us a warrant and a process through that country's legal system. Uh, Verizon actually sent a court, the court, a friend of the court letter supporting Microsoft in this, fighting against this search. And now Apple, Cisco, and AT&T have also filed briefs on Friday supporting Microsoft in its appeal of the decision requiring it to hand over data about an Irish customer to U.S. law enforcement officials. <clears throat> Now, I, I'm, I don't know. I guess maybe I'm just a, st a skeptical guy. This almost, you have to wonder if this is almost a PR thing, but it also makes sense. Essentially, the U.S. government saying, well, because you're a U.S. company, we can get a U.S. warrant and have you go get data out of the data center that this U.S. company owns in Ireland. And Microsoft says, oh, no, 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 no. We, I mean, they're probably, they're probably incorporated over there, too. Uh, so this is pursuant to the Stored Communications Act. Microsoft must provide these law enf enforcement officials with the contents of this Irish customer's email which is stored in servers located in Dublin. Microsoft and its peers argued that the warrant defies both the Stored Communications Act and, norm and numerous international law, actually, including treaties the United States has in place with other countries, Ireland among them, regarding how to handle requests about, data's, uh, about their citizens' data. It's kind of interesting to see these guys push back. I almost wonder, Mumble Room, what do you guys think? Is this, uh, is this to sort of make up for all the prism revelations and things like that, or is this legit? I think they have to do this, right? Because if they don't, and countries realize that they're just going to hand over their customers' data to the U.S., ah, yes. then those countries are going to push back against Microsoft, no, nobody and that could means trust Microsoft a, loses money. Nobody could trust a U.S. company. Right. Yeah. It's, not, it's, it's not just going to be Microsoft. It's going to be everyone, like the MPAA, who will go, oh, yeah, we want that person because <laughs> right. whatever. Yes, you're right. You're and, right. And at the same time, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of pushback from even Google, about to, towards the NSA. So perhaps this is Microsoft just pushing back a little as well. Yeah, I think this is like you get I think it's you guys have all nailed it. I think uh, it's a little bit of we have to let we have to let customers outside the US know they're safe so they can trust our products. Uh, we have to make a good public stance. And um, this is, I think, too, part of it is the case that the government's going after is just a drug enforcement case. And I think the I, I think Microsoft's potential thinking here is if we allow this if we allow this drug enforcement case to open the door then the next time they come in and if it's a cybersecurity threat or a terrorism threat well because we open the door for a drug enforcement request that precedent is now set you know we we've we've gone down that path if you will and i think that's another reason why they're pushing back is like now is the time to stand our ground this line no father all right next news headline this is a big one um, and uh, this is one that I'm going to read you today because it's breaking as as we're going on the air. I've gone through it. I haven't had a full chance to do a full analysis, so I'll continue to sort of analyze this over the week and kind of update you guys as we get more uh, information. So this is it. Chinese government reveals Microsoft's secret list of Android killer patents. Now, we've all heard of everybody. Everybody striking these patent deals with Microsoft. And we've wondered, like, what does Microsoft have over these guys? And some of the patents we've seen have seemed a little weak. Uh, I've, I've read some of them before on some of our other shows, and we've kind of had a little laugh at them. Uh, well, this time, uh, it's not so much the case. So this is an article over at uh, Ars Technica. Uh, Joe Mullen wrote this up. And let me give you guys a little bit of background. So you guys know that Microsoft has held a line that loads of its patents are infringed by Google. In fact, in 2001... 
they wrote, licensing is the solution. That was the IP head honcho writing on the Microsoft blog saying, this is how we're going to solve this problem. Well, license. Uh, this was back about when Barnes & Noble was being sued for Microsoft over the Nook. For the most part, uh, this, the patents that Microsoft is using to sort of scare these guys into signing these agreements has been kept secret. Sort of led to speculation about what Microsoft might be holding over Android. But now, a list of hundreds of patents that uh, Microsoft believes entitles it to royalties over Android phones and smartphones in particular, have been published. It's in the Chinese language right now. That's another reason why analysis is a little hard at this time. Um, translation is happening as we do this show. But uh, they include lots of technologies developed actually at Microsoft. So genuine innovations out of the Microsoft shop, as well as a bunch of patents Microsoft acquired by that Rockstar Consortium, which spent $4.5 billion on patents that were auctioned off after Nortel uh, filed bankruptcy uh, Microsoft, I believe RIM and Apple and uh, several others were part of that essentially as a, as a hedge against Android. So this Chinese agency that's involved with a, with a lawsuit over with a luggage company in China, I believe, has published these patents on their website. They say the longer list, here's, a, here's essentially a breakdown of what we know so far. 73 patents are said to be st standard essential patents. That means Microsoft can legitimately own them, but Microsoft is required by law to license them at a fair market price. Uh, they're implemented in smartphones, generally followed by 127 patents that Microsoft says are implemented specifically in Android. So the 73 patents previously that are standard essential are in all smartphones, including iPhones and Blackberries and all that other stuff, and even a canonical phone if they ever ship one. Uh, and 127 patents that are specific to Android itself. And these are non-standard essential patents. There's also 68 patents uh, for applications that are on Android and uh, 42 other patents that are just listed as general that apply to some Android devices. There's also some newly revealed stuff, that, like patent, get ready for this one, it rolls off the tongue, 8255379, customer local search, or representing reoccurring events, these things like this we've known about uh, that Microsoft actually does claim to have a patent to. So this is the first time we've ever seen this list, and some of it's like, um, some of it's like communicating with the GPS chip to get your signal type stuff. It's really basic stuff. Uh, some of it's like basic how the phone operates on the network stuff that Microsoft just happened to be in. Uh, one of them, uh, patent 5982324, describes combining GPS with cell signals in an efficient position location system. This is assisted GPS. All of our phones have this. And There's Microsoft got to be prior art. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, you don't know. I mean, I suppose if these were publicly challenged in court, we might have an idea. But they've always well, been a yeah. secret. Well, yeah, and exactly. That's kind of what I'm the the general idea where I'm going is that um, prior to this revelation, anybody who Microsoft approached about their patents, they made sign an NDA. Right. So, and at this point, now we're starting to get an idea about what those patents are, and it just seems like. It's stuff that has been in basic basics and phones in a lot of for cases. Eons. But some of it, is, they say, was genuinely developed at Microsoft. Like so, uh, you know, I mean, if it's out of, I mean, and they say, I think the the the, the staggering thing is, seventy three patents are said to be standard essentials, which apply to all smartphones. All doesn't matter if it's Android or what. It's all smartphones. Seventy three of them. So if you're in the smartphone game, Microsoft's got seventy three reasons to knock on your door. Wow. That's a big deal, I think, and and uh, it's so it's so interesting. What we're watching is the incumbents who managed to get into a you know a very wealthy position and then uh, build up these war chests, and then the new market disruptor disruptors come along. In some cases, it's these same companies that are bringing that along. In some cases, it's companies like Google, and you do see in a way how like even if y y there's. There's just there is a, a certain cost, a certain drag that is put on the market, that is put on innovation when you have to shackle it with costs like this. Uh, and, you know, Android is a free operating system, except for these 127 patents that specifically apply to Android that Google, that Microsoft claims they own, and then it's not so free anymore. And it's just a, it's it, it sort of it sort of defeats the whole purpose of what Google was trying to achieve by making a free mobile platform that anybody could use to build on unless they're rich enough to pay Microsoft. And I would assume Microsoft gets a cut per devices in most cases. Uh, oh, yeah, some, they, some... Make more, they make more money off of Android yeah. than they do pretty much any other platform. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think that's the future of Microsoft right there, the cloud and licensing stuff. Yeah, yeah maybe. Maybe that's their reward for that crazy-ass R&D division they've had for forever that they've never... 
You know, Microsoft is famous for their R&D, but you ha hardly ever see anything actually come of it. Maybe it's just been developing a, a patent war chest. Maybe that's what they've been doing. Maybe that's been their product. Which is why patent reform needs to happen. Hmm. All right. So uh, I got uh, some good news, something to uh, cheer us all up before uh, we get to a security update. Uh, there is uh, some dates leaked for the Steam summer sale. Just uh, wanted to give everybody a chance to... Uh, prepare their lap uh, their wallets maybe you need to uh, lose your wallet for the next week because here it comes june 19th through june 30th will be the steam summer sale and this is rumored of course not confirmed at this point none of these dates or listings are confirmed but it does match up with a couple other events that are going on in the valve community and also coincides with the fact that good old games is doing a big sale right now gog.com so they're kind of like doing their sale before the steam sale but <clears throat> The Steam Summer Sale is fairly famous, and people on Reddit have been preparing for weeks, and now we have dates. So June 19th through the 30th, that's just one week. Uh, and I wanted to mention it now because it's the end. it starts at the end of this week. I think that's Thursday, right, guys? 30th is third. No. Next week. No. Next week. So you have a little time. June 19th is, okay, so it starts Thursday, and it'll end... Um, on next Monday. So yeah, week on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. So there you two, go. So you got. So it'll start this Thursday. It'll start later this week. Boom. Time math right there on the show. Okay. So <laughs> bef before we get to the security stuff, I wanted to stop and mention that Tech Talk today and the Jupiter Broadcasting Network is an experiment, and your crowdfunding is helping us make this experiment successful. Uh, when I started Tech Talk today, I wanted to do something. I wanted to push myself. I wanted to see if I could do a daily show. And essentially, I thought, gosh, I'm, I need to get into the office every day and build a routine and start a, start the workday up. So I'm going to get in, in the mornings. I'm going to do a morning show, hang out with the Jupiter Broadcasting community, update them on the tech news from a Linux user's perspective. But wouldn't it be great if we could use this show as a rallying point to crowdfund the network? So that way we can keep the sponsorships down to a minimum. We don't have to rely on affiliate programs that get pulled out from underneath us once it's no longer profitable for the other party. We can just super serve the audience who funds us directly. You consume the content, you pay for the content. It's actually a lot more like a traditional model of the arts from a previous generation. So if you go over to patreon.com slash today, you can pledge a dollar amount that you're comfortable with. I have a suggesting starting price at $3, but whatever you're comfortable with, you can pledge at. We also have uh, some predefined pledge levels, including the uh, Swag Club, which does have a couple of more slots left. And I'm just going to tell you right here, I am today, I am demoing uh, this. Uh, this, is a, this is where I, I get to prototype some of the possible Swag Club member swag. This is a jacket that's perfect for the summer when it's kind of, or spring when it's a little crappy out. It's got a hood. But the best part is it has the Tech Talk Today logo on it. Look at that. I don't know if you guys can see that. Boom, right there. So, And it's also got it on the back. And this is what we're going to do is for folks who support this show at the highest pledge level, you become part of our swag club. And from time to time, we'll send out swag to you as a thank you for supporting the Jupiter Broadcast Network because at that level, you're not just keeping the show on the air. You're keeping the network on the air. You're keeping all of the shows on the air. You are giving us the bandwidth to tr try out new projects and do crazy things that... Honestly, we just don't have the funding to do. So go over to patreon.com slash today to pledge for this show. Keep this show on the air. And then we'll celebrate these milestones right here on the show. Our next milestone is a little bit off. We're trying to get to $2,400 per month. And uh, we're at $1,755 right now. Close, 176 patrons. I would love to get up to that next milestone because as we start to get to there, I might have a little room to pay people on a contract basis to you know do things like come on this show or uh, work for us on site, on location doing camera stuff, or help do uh, audio and lighting rigging for certain events and stuff. There's like, once we get that funding level up a little bit, I can, right now, my biggest, my biggest growth barrier is just having enough people to do the things we need done, and we just have to have a certain level of funding to get there. There's also equipment limitations we're at right now, big, big equipment limitations that are driving me absolutely insane. Uh, and you can help us out with that too. Patreon.com slash today. And thanks everybody for supporting the show and the network. We really, really, really do appreciate it. All right, I want to give you guys a little bit of a security update. Uh, this is just some interesting stuff that caught my uh, my attention over the weekend and I wanted to make sure it didn't get buried. Well, we might talk about some of this more in TechSnap too because it's great uh, content for TechSnap. I don't know if you guys are familiar with a company called Stratford. Uh, they were an intelligence essentially contract agency and they had a really, really embarrassing hack. Uh, not too long ago, and uh, you can go over there. Go to uh, you can check the show notes out and read this whole one for yourself. It's a really great write-up. Talks about in 2011, a group of skilled hackers broke into Stratford and compromised the data of something like 860,000 customers of their uh, 
of their uh, intelligence agency for hire, essentially a privatized CIA, including one of their customers. One of the information they breached was <laughs> was the uh, former uh, vice president, CIA director, and secretary of state, among others. So a few uh, a few well known um, U.S. officials. Here's the great part, though, and this is the part I wanted to point out because. I think probably a lot of our listeners are sysadmins, and you guys know what's up when I say this. According to the documents, so uh, Stratford engaged with Verizon to conduct a business slash cyber trust and in con- conduct a forensic investigation into the breach. Now, uh, Verizon fa- filed a 66-page report, and uh, they talk about some of the things on the Stratford network that led to this breach. And uh, my sysadmin brethren, get ready for this. For starters, the time of the attack at the time of the attack. No password management policy existed within Stratford. Passwords at times were shared between employees, and nothing prevented the same passwords from being used on multiple devices. Users commonly use the same password to access email as the password to remotely access the systems containing, get this, sensitive information. And according to Verizon, there was no antivirus software on the Windows machines, which left Stratford wide open to not only the more sophisticated and customized hacker attempts, but also just run-of-the-mill viruses. Another significant factor in the breach was the design of Stratford's e-commerce environment, which facilitated electronic transfer of payments by its customers, of course, because they're big-dollar customers. According to the report, this system was accessible needlessly from anywhere within the company's network, as well as the Internet itself directly. So there you go. There's your intelligence agency contractor for hire, and they blew it big time. There is a cluster for you. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it really, you know, it fundamentally comes down to does system architecture design, network security policy, standard, and they talk about how they didn't have proper logging, all of it. It's, all, it's, a, great, it's a great read. So if you're in the sysadmin business and you want to go read that, uh, it's, it's totes worth it. It's totes worth See, it. See, what's funny is that anywhere I've ever worked where we've had any sort of a security policy, bright, you know, sharing passwords that's a terminable offense yeah yeah it should be because that's that's a major security breach the problem is the problem is there is uh you know it's it's a workflow thing right people people get slowed down with password problems and you know they need they need susan's password so that way they can log in when she goes on vacation and then eventually it just goes from there uh you know and and then having and then if you're at a company that has like a certain you know um a certain political structure where you know forcing people to do certain things like rotate their passwords isn't really within your power like that's just the way the politics of the company are structured there's really nothing you can do as a sysadmin other than just sit back and and watch it all burn and know that eventually something's coming our way because i cannot get these people to take care of themselves and it's very stressful for the sysadmin because you you recognize the problem but you are underfunded you are under empowered to make these changes um and and then of course it's still your fault when right. the breach happens, right? That's why companies go through so many IT directors. <laughs> so so <laughs> yeah. they had their stuff exposed to the internet. Yeah, yeah, they did. It's it is the, it's really a cluster of problems that, way, that they had there. It, it was like they painted a bullseye on their back. That way, Dick Cheney could uh, log in and make payments uh, remotely from the White House. He didn't have to <laughs> write a check. Uh, so look, uh, hey, are you guys addicted to podcasts? You guys think maybe you're addicted to podcasts? I am. Yeah. I am. Yours. I, I, yeah. I'm addicted to this, this <laughs> yeah, network. Yeah, Jupiter Broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wasn't even going. I wasn't even angling that way. No, I just wanted to say we had a great show on the uh, faux show uh, last night, episode 181, uh, Addicted to Podcasts. And this was the top 26 signs you could be a podcast addict. And I think 24 of them applied to me. And one of them, <laughs> like, one of them. It was Ange got me so good in this episode. Plus, I uh, I picked some of my favorite podcasts and my podcast players for Android and iOS. So go check out Faux Show One Eighty One, addicted to podcasts. What you want more show? There you go, Faux Show One Eighty One. That was a good episode. And also, also, I want to encourage you to visit our subreddit and help give me an idea of what you want covered on this very show. Go over to TechTalkToday.reddit.com. A couple of Bitcoin stories in there. I've been thinking about talking about Bitcoin a little bit more. I don't know if you guys saw, but. Uh, the feds who seized the Silk Road founders' bitcoins have announced they're going to sell them. So the the price of Bitcoin has has actually begun to rebound. But for la- for the last week, it was totally on the slide. Uh, and now um, uh, Ars Technica, and it's at the top of our Tech Talk Today subreddit, uh, says that uh, there is a 51% network attack problem for Bitcoin, which there there is. 
uh, there's always been a, a potential for it, and they they make it, they write up a good thing about it. So if you've if you've never heard about the 51% attack on the Bitcoin network, Ars Technica has an article about that, which is at the top of the Tech Talk today subreddit. So we'll probably do some Bitcoin coverage coming up here in the future because I can tell by the subreddit that appears to be a subject that interests you guys, and that's what I use that for. I get an idea of what you want in this show, and uh, you guys can even just leave comments for feedback. I try to put a, a link to every single episode in there for your feedback. And one last thing, I hate to do it, but I could use your help. Could you go over to iTunes and rate this show and comment? We're in iTunes now. The badge is working in iTunes. Um, we've got one comment in there. And the thing is, is if a lot of you do it, and it really is going to require pretty much all of you who have access to iTunes to do it because very few of you use iTunes. If all of you who have access to iTunes go in there and do it for me, uh, that'll help uh, this show uh, jump up in the uh, charts so people find it. So when they do searches for a daily talk show, they will find it. And essentially, if a show doesn't have any ratings or comments, it's never exposed to iTunes users. So the only way to really help us is if you go in there. And because we cater to an audience that doesn't use iTunes very much, um, it's a major area where we're deficient in, and it it, uh, it prevents us from getting exposed to tens of thousands of potential listeners. So if you could help us, by, and I can't do it all myself because of the nature of this p problem. So if you can go into iTunes and find Tech Talk Today's MP3 feed and comment and rate, it all has to be on one particular feed. That uh, would really help the show and help other people find it as well, which would be great for the network in general. So thanks, you guys, for tuning in today. we got a great week lined up. We're watching the headlines every single day, so tune in for that. And then as uh, Amazon's events approach and Google I.O. approaches, we'll be getting coverage lined up for that. And we could have some Bitcoin coverage coming up, too. So that'll wrap us up for today's episode of Tech Talk Today. See you right back here tomorrow. Before we go, I almost forgot, I did go out and get you something new, something fresh, something a little different than the previous videos we've watched. I thought, since we're all technology geeks, we'd love to see a 1980s commercial on digital computers. You guys, did you know there was actually a company called Digital Computers? Well, there was, and they had a great ad. The people who worked with computers were considered magicians. Abracadabra! But digital took the mystery out of computers. Digital Equipment Corporation pioneered the mini computer, making compact, easy to use systems that can grow with your business. From your independent digital supplier, you can get hardware and software from one source without any hocus pocus. Digital, we took the mystery out of computers.